Hello everyone, once again I welcome you all to MSB lecture series on interpretive spectroscopy. Uh, since my last lecture I started really looking into lot of problems and giving the right kind of solutions, uh, real interpretation I started considering problems although I was discussing many problems in between while discussing many of the spectroscopic methods, let me focus your attention entirely to only looking into the problems and uh, different ways of finding solutions when some data is given from any of these spectroscopic methods. So let us begin today uh, with another problem. Solve the structure using the following spectral data. Molecular formula is given here. So I am going to show you 1 HNMR spectrum in a minute or so. Now first you look into the formula and try to make familiar yourself how many different type of elements are there in it. In this one carbon is there, hydrogen is there, bromine is there and oxygen is there. So molecular formula is given but structural formula is not given that is more important. And now when this compound is given we also know whether the compound is saturated or unsaturated whether double bond, triple bond is there by looking into hydrogen deficiency index. So that formula I am sure you are familiar. Let me write again. C plus 1 minus half H minus half X, X is halogens and half N. So this one should remember, this is the formula we use to identify hydrogen deficiency index. From this one we can get information about possibility of a presence of a ring, a double bond and triple bond. So if I use here 8 is there, 8 plus 1, 8 plus 1 minus 7 by 2 means 3.5 and minus half 0.5 equals 9 minus 4 equals 5. So that means here the deficiency is 5, 5 means certainly there is a ring and plus 4 double bonds. Now we know that ring is there means probably aromatic group a benzene ring is there and then that will take care of three double bonds and the ring. So now we have to account for one more double bond. So that means we have O possibility of a ketonic carbonyl group or O methoxy group or something would be there. Now let us with this information let us look into 1 HNMR spectrum. You can see here. And in NMR spectrum first identify number of groups of identical protons are present. So that you can just see by simply counting the number of multiplets we see here. We have here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 groups are there. That means you can clearly tell 6 different type of hydrogen atoms are there. When you look into a doublet is there which is around 3.7 or something say there is a doublet here. And then we have two triplets closely spaced that means they have very similar chemical shifts and similarly we have two more doublets again they have very similar chemical shifts and then we have a triplet far away much de-shielded. So that means probably this could be due to a aldehydic or acidic, acidic hydrogen means it does not show any coupling so it must be aldehydic hydrogen. So that means we know now. And then by looking into this probably it looks like they are from aromatic group. Now let us try to write down the structure here. First I would write a benzene ring something like this. Then bromo group is there. So let me put one bromo group here and then by just looking into this probably there is a something like this I can write. Now we look into how many different type of proton signals can be expected for this one. So certainly 1, 2, 3, 4, only 4. So if you just see here because you can do free rotation C2 axis 
as a result what happens? These two will these two will be identical that means 1, 2, 3, 4. So, here you can anticipate four different type of proton thickness, but we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are there. So, this is ruled out, this not. So, next let us consider another one. So, now let me put it here. If I put here, now what happens? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all are different here. And then once after identifying now, we have to check whether we get triplet pattern or not. For example, if I consider this hydrogen here, this is equally coupled to these two hydrogens. As a result, this can show a triplet and similarly, this hydrogen can also show a triplet and this can also show a triplet. And then this one is coupled only to this one, show a doublet. And similarly, this can show a doublet. And now this one would show a doublet here, this one, and this will show a triplet. This triplet is here. This is. So now we have identified the compound is this one. So now let us see what information here. And now, to further conclusion, we have 13 C NMR also. 13 C NMR again, it will tell you. If I look into 13 C NMR of first compound, para bromo substituted uh, aldehyde, benzyl aldehyde. So, we can see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 carbon will be there. But again, here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 are there. That means all 8 carbon atoms are non equivalent. That means, here if I just look into it, in this ortho bromo, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all are different we are getting. So, that means, without any hesitation, one can assign this spectrum and write the structure for this one should be like this. This is the compound. Hydrogen deficiency, fine. So, now, yes, this is the compound here. Now, we can identify signals, yes, 7.33, 7.33. 3, 3 here and these two are showing triplets and then this is higher and this is slightly higher than this one, this is a doublet again and further high because next to bromo this is one and then 3.66 it should be a doublet, here it is okay for this one and then this hydrogen here, this one it is showing a triplet because of coupling with this two, okay. So, very easy right, so this is how one can do very nicely interpretation. Of course, when we have for molecular formula, we should first uh, find out hydrogen deficiency index uh, by simply looking into this uh, formula here and then you should be able to identify. So, now for curiosity sake, let us uh, try to analyze the spectrum of para bromo. As I said, in case of para bromo, we should, ex we are expecting 1, 2, 3, 4 different type of hydrogen atoms okay, four different type of uh, proton signals and then one, two, three, four, five, six different type of carbon signals. I have also uh, simulated that one. Let us look into that now. Okay, so this is again for 13C, all the uh, signals, chemical shifts are assigned here. Okay, so 199, you know again, keto uh, aldehydic carbon will come here and then we have here uh, six and then one here, this is due to this one here. So, now this is the one, the four signals. As I mentioned here, uh, we should get four signals for this one. One, two, three, four. Yes, four signals are there. These two will be showing doublet and this will be again a triplet. This one will be again a doublet here and then this would show a triplet here, very similar to ortho bromo one, except for we have two more signals here because of non-equivalence of all the hydrogen atoms. And as I mentioned, in case of 13C, we also expect 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different signals. I have here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6 are there. Yes, this is for para bromo benzyl aldehyde. Now, let us look into another problem here. An organic molecule shows two absorption peaks at 870 and 975 hertz in a magnetic field of 3 Tesla. What are the corresponding chemical shifts in PPM? Okay, first, yeah, it is given in hertz. 
we have to convert into ppm. Before you convert this into ppm, we should know, this is a 13 C NMR, we should know first the frequency corresponding to pre Tesla. To solve this problem, what we should do is first we should find out the frequency corresponding to 13 C nucleus with respect to magnetic field strength of pre Tesla. For that one, we should use this equation H nu equals gamma H over 2 pi B naught. So we know now nu equals gamma over 2 pi to B naught. Okay, simply if you use the formula here and then apply here, we have gyromagnetic ratio is given here 6.7263 into 10 raise to 7 to B naught over 222 by 7. By simplification of this one, what we get is 32.1 or approximately 32 hertz. That means the frequency corresponding to 13 C in a magnetic field strength of 3 Tesla is 32 hertz. So now we know, now we have to convert the given peaks in hertz to ppm. First let us consider 87. So to convert delta, we know that delta in hertz over the frequency. So here this is 870 by 32 is 1 and another one is 975 by 32. So this will give you 27.1 ppm and this would give you 30.4 ppm. So that means this one is 27.1 ppm and this one is 30.4 ppm. Now you know that this chemical shift presented in ppm is independent of magnetic field strength. So now let us go to another problem here, very similar problem. In a magnetic field of strength 2.349 Tesla, the resonance frequency of 15N nuclei is 10.13 megahertz. What is the resonance frequency of 15N in a magnet of 11.745 Tesla? So that means we are considering two magnetic fields and also we are focusing on 15N nucleus. So in 2.349 Tesla magnetic field, the resonance frequency for 15N is 10.13. So now we have to find out what would be this value with a magnetic field strength of 11.745 Tesla. So it is very simple here. So again you use the same equation H nu equals gamma over 2 pi to B naught. So H we can remove this one. So we can remember this way. So now what we can do is. 1 equals gamma, and this is constant, we can ignore this one, time being, and B naught 1, and then nu 2 equals gamma, remains same, it is not given and it is not necessary now. So we can cancel this one, so nu 1 by 2 equals So let us say this one is given value here 10.1 then we have to find out this one in this. So nu 2 we have to find out nu 1, b 1 is there and this is also known. Now nu 2 equals So here this would come around approximately 5. That means if you just simply look into the ratio of this one, this is 5 times more. So that is what we are getting here and then 1.3. So this will give you 50.65 hertz. So this is megahertz. 
So this is how you can calculate. It's very simple now. Even if you take the ratio of two magnetic field, and we know it's five times. So that obviously, if it is 10, 0.13 into 5, it will be 50.65 will be the corresponding frequency for a 15N of magnetic field strength, 11.745 Tesla. Okay. Let's see one more problem. In NMR spectrometer commonly used in medicine, the resonance frequency for the protons in water is 60 megahertz. If such an instrument was to be used to observe 31 feet, what frequency of radio radiation would be required? So this is again a simple question. So here water, it is 60 megahertz. And then we have to find out what would be the frequency for phosphorus if the field strength is 60 megahertz. If the frequency corresponding to hydrogen is 60 megahertz, and then if such an instrument was to be used to observe 31 p, what frequency of radio frequency would be required? So it's very simple. The what information that is missing is gyromagnetic ratio is not given. Gyromagnetic ratio for phosphorus is 10.841 for phosphorus. For hydrogen, it is 26. 752. This is very important. This is not given. Without this, it is very difficult to find out. So now let us see. D is constant. The magnetic field is constant. This we need at least here. So now we should be able to solve this problem. So, P is 10.841 and then this is 26.752 into 60. So, this will come around 24.31 hertz. So, that means here if you just consider this will be approximately 0 0.0, this would come around approximately 0 0.405 or something it comes. And then if you multiply this one by 60, you should get it. So that means corresponding frequency for phosphorus in a known magnetic field, if the watt has 60 megahertz, then the phosphorus will be having 24.3 megahertz. So 1H has 1H 60. So this corresponds to 31P equals 24.31 megahertz. So now we have another problem here. I have also given the solution here. The magnetogyric ratio of the deuterium to H or D nucleus is approximately 6.5 times smaller than that of the proton. So in a magnet where one H spectrum can be observed at about 400 megahertz, what is the approximate radio frequency radiation you would need to observe the 2 H NMR spectrum? So that means in a magnetic field strength, known magnetic field strength, if the 1H NMR is observed at 400 megahertz, so then what would be the corresponding frequency for deuterium? The question asked for a comparison between the frequencies required for the observation of protons and deuterium in the same magnet under the same magnetic field strength. The magnetogyric ratio of 1H is 6.5 times that of 2H. That means we also know the uh, frequency, I mean, gyromagnetic ratio also we know. 2H will be, so it simply what you can do is 2H frequency equals 1H frequency by 6.5. 6.5 is the ratio of gamma 1 to gamma 2. So that comes around 61.54 hertz. So this is how we can look into the problem here. So sir, let's look into one more interesting problem before I conclude this lecture. This already I discussed, I believe, while looking into NMR while discussing NMR spectroscopy. The structure of tertiary butyl lithium is similar to that of methyl lithium. And you should know the fact that both exist as tetrameric compounds, but with each H atom replaced by a methyl group, tertiary butyl lithium is very similar to methyl lithium, where methyl is replaced by tertiary butyl. So 13C NMR spectrum of a sample of tertiary butyl lithium four times, prepared from six lithium metal so here we are taken exclusively six Li isotope, consists of two signals 
one for the methyl carbons and one for the quaternary carbon atom. The signals for the quaternary carbon is shown below at two different temperatures. One, uh, this one is taken at 185 K and this one is taken at 299 K. That means there is a dramatic difference is there in the multiplet pattern at recorded at 185 K and 299 K. So, how these signals arise and then the further information is 6 lithium I equals 1. So, now we are looking into 13 C spectrum. So, for this one, one should know the geometry of tertiary butyl lithium. I have sh shown you that one in here. So, let us look into this one here. The red ones are lithium and these are all tertiary butyl one carbons having three tertiary butyl something like this. So, now we can see and they are occupying alternate corners. Lithium and T-butyl carbon are occupying alternate corners of cubane. And then you can imagine this one like a lithium tetrahedra similar to white phosphorus. And now each triangular faces of three lithiums, one T-butyl carbon is interacting and then this leads to four centered two electron bond. Go back now. At 185K, we are seeing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we are seeing. And then at 299, we are seeing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we are seeing. So now this we have to explain. So that means at this temperature, what happens if you assume lithiums like this in one of the place, and then we have the structure is static. As a result, this carbon is confined to these three. When it is confined to these three, what would happen? It is interacting with these. That means if I use 2 Ni plus 1 rule here, so 2, 3 into 1 plus 1, so 7 comes, 7 is coming here. But on the other end, at 299, because of flexionality, what happens? This carbon will be moving to another, and then this one, this one, as a result, what happens? So each carbon will look into four equivalent lithium atoms. So in that case, if I use 2 Ni plus 1, this is because of dynamics, flexionality. Now, 2 into 4 are there. So this 9 lines. That is the reason we see at slightly higher temperature, we are seeing 9 lines, whereas at low temperature, it has a static structure. Each carbon is linked to three lithium atoms. And at 299K, due to flexional process, quaternary carbon is four equivalent lithium atoms. Hence, we see nine lines. This is the structure. One should remember about that one. You can see here how this you can visualize each methyl group or tetrabutyl group confined to one of the four triangular faces of three lithium atoms. With this, let me stop here and uh, continue, you know, more problems in my next lecture. Until then, have an excellent time. Thank you. Thank you.